I think the feeling of being between two cultures, it can feel like you're occupying them both at the same time, but also not really belonging to them either. Masha Rumer immigrated to the United States from the former Soviet Union when she was 13 years old. Her family was fleeing economic uncertainty and religious discrimination. And at first, her nationality made her feel self-conscious in America. She wanted to blend in with her new friends as fast as possible, get the right clothes, learn the language. Over time, Masha discovered her love for her homeland never really went away, and she wanted to share it with her own children, which turned out to be a lot more complicated than she thought. In this episode of Fireside with Blair Hodges, we're talking with Masha Rumer, author of the book Parenting with an Accent, how immigrants honor their heritage, navigate setbacks, and chart new paths for their children. Masha Rumor, thanks for joining me here at Fireside today. Blair, thank you so much for having me here. I've been listening to your podcast for a while and I'm really thrilled to be as a guest on your show. I'm excited to have you. We've actually known each other for a long time. We met back at Georgetown University. We were both students there in uh, 2011 or something like that. That's right, 2011. It's hard to believe. So we've known each other a long time and now you're a published author. You've got this new book that you just put out called Parenting with an Accent, How Immigrants Honor Their Heritage, Navigate Setbacks, and Chart new paths for their children. So first of all, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Blair. Yes, it's one of those things I can now check off my life to-do list. I'm I'm really excited. I mean, I've always wanted to write a book, but this particular book I've been kind of thinking about for many years in different iterations, and it took me about four years, and, and now it's out. And you've been a writer for a while. I've followed your writing. You've been published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Moscow Times, and elsewhere. But to have a full book out, that's a really big project. You said it took four years. Why did you decide to do this particular book? I felt like it's a book that I wish I could have read when I first had kids. And even I would say before kids, I see writing certainly as a form of self-expression, but when I write and just, I see it as, as a way to bring light to certain issues that many people are struggling with or experiencing. This is something that's always motivated my um, journalism career as well. And when I first had my first child, whom you've met, I think at a, at a holiday party, a Christmas party, Three, four years ago. Yeah, yeah. Was, we were painting ornaments together. That's right. Um, so when I first had my daughter, I realized that I was having this culture shock all over again. So just for background, I'm an immigrant. I was born in the former Soviet Union and I immigrated. I came to the United States as a refugee when I was 13 years old, um, right after the Soviet Union fell. So I didn't really speak much English. I listened to a lot of the Beatles, tried to <laughs> kind of catch up that way. And um, so obviously went through my you know share of culture shock and like the whole immigrant experience, so, which was not necessarily very pleasant, but you know, then kind of became, you know, became an American, had my life here. And when I had uh, my first baby, my daughter, I had this culture shock all over again. And it brought up all kinds of questions about how do I preserve the heritage of my ancestors or how do I make sure that I kind of fit into the society today while also honoring those roots brought up all kinds of memories, all kinds of traumas that my own people have gone through. And I really struggled with all those issues, also language. So I, I wish there was a way to kind of understand that and process it and also kind of share what I know and also give other people an opportunity to talk about their experiences. And so I started kind of writing articles and essays, getting them published. And I've always thought that I wanted this to be kind of a larger project, a book. The more I talk to other people, whether they spoke my language or, you know, from anywhere in the world, really, we all kind of struggled with similar issues and questions. And that's when I decided that this needs to be a book. I was surprised as I was looking around after reading your book, I was looking for similar books, talking about being an immigrant, talking about parenting. And there there aren't a lot, which is kind of surprising because as you point out in your introduction, the foreign born population in the United States right now is about 45 million people. And that's you say that's the population of Florida, New Jersey and Illinois combined. So there's a lot of people out there, but not a lot of books. Why do you think that is? Actually, thank you, Blair, for bringing that up. One thing I actually failed to mention is that, uh, of course, you know, a lot of us when we look for resources, when we're struggling with something, we may, you know, turn to our friends, to our family members, to writing. And I was looking far and wide for books that kind of captured that immigrant experience, not, you know, in fiction form, not in like, here's how you do it form. These are the steps you should take to teach your child a second language. That, that's not what I was looking for. 
but something that was like supportive, conversational, something you can relate to, commiserate with, and, you know, maybe learn from, but also just feel supported and seen. That's what I really wanted to, to be seen and not feel like some kind of a weirdo struggling with these issues, like I'm alone. And it turned out that I wasn't. Yeah. So there were no books like that that I could find. I'm not sure why. I think um, there's certainly the language barrier. I kind of straddle, I would say, both cultures because on the one hand, I preserved quite well my own background because I was 13, but at the same time, I've, I'd like to think I've been able to acculturate to, to the best of my ability, maybe not, not fully, certainly, to the American culture or cultures, the compendulum of those. So I, I guess I had that voice and that ability to see both at the same time, but I'm not sure. I know there is definitely a huge demand. That's what I've been hearing. But when I started pitching this to literary agents and uh, they pitched it to publishers, a couple of responses I received were, oh, nobody's going to read this because there's not a huge demographic for that. Or who is mm. going to read this book? Um, there's not enough immigrant parents. But mm. just like you said, we have the highest number of immigrants ever right now. <laughs> and anyone I speak to pretty much, no matter what language, no matter when they came, even if they are children of immigrants, like they want to understand their mom better, who was say like from Korea. Or maybe they teach immigrant children at the school where they work, or maybe they work with refugee resettlement. Um, they all feel like this is relevant to them. So... I think it's also an issue of representation yeah. and I think we have been seeing a huge shift in that in the last few years, rightfully so, because there's so many voices that need to have their perspectives shared. I'm glad you pointed that out because the book that you wrote is not like a technical how-to manual. This isn't a book that's just for parents who are immigrants who want to see, okay, here are the steps that you take. It includes advice, it includes suggestions, but it also tells a lot of stories. And so I, I think this book would be interesting for readers, whether they're immigrant parents themselves or not, to get a sense of what it's like to be an immigrant parent, what it's like to immigrate to the United States and deal with cultural changes and deal with loss and grief and excitement and new opportunities and all of these things that I could I could relate to in different ways, even though I grew up here, this, this is my native country, so I'm not an immigrant parent. But your book has advice for immigrant parents, but stories for immigrant parents as well. Exactly. This is exactly what I was hoping to do. And I would say this has like always been my writing style. I tried to share stories. And like you said, a lot of them are about grief and loss. A lot of people I spoke to, you know, speak about discrimination and racism, certainly within their own community, within their family, in the outside community. And they share how they cope with it. But at the same time, so I approached this as a journalist and as a parent, um, but I was really lucky to be able to interview experts and have a huge amount of research done. And I would say there are like 20 pages at the end. Maybe you've noticed this is just footnotes, like in really tiny, small print. So I really like geeked out on research and I wanted to make sure that everything that I share is up to date, as much vetted as possible. I even hired a fact checker that usually not provided mm, by publishers yeah. just to make sure that th there was like very little room for error. And I talked to people, like I talked to psychologists, I spoke to experts in uh, language development and bilingualism, including a professor from Canada, Dr. Ellen Bialystok, who received the Medal of Honor from, from, from Canada, basically for the theory that she she's postulated, saying that kids who are bilingual tend to better at better multitasking and certain other cognitive abilities. And bilingual adults can also stave off the onset of dementia by about four to five years. Um, so I talked to her. Um, I talked to people who are preschool owners, uh, school teachers, sociologists. So I tried to do as much of that as possible to kind of create a bigger picture. Obviously, there's so much more to say on the topic, but I, I tried to be as representative as possible. I, I interviewed like, a, I would say over 60 people, like 60 people across the country. Probably maybe even more could have been if COVID <laughs> didn't happen. Right. And these are people from all over the world. This isn't just about, you, you came from the former Soviet Union. You've got people from all over the world in this and you weave their stories in with your own story and you find really great connections there. So it's got a lot of facts. It's got a lot of research uh, information in here, but it's all presented through these stories. And this is why I think this book reaches a bigger audience than just parents who are immigrants. Uh, you mentioned a minute ago that you came to the United States when you're 13 years old. So from the former Soviet Union, that's a big thing in the news right now. Obviously, Russia is in the war with Ukraine right now. Um, and so before we maybe talk more about what's happening now, I'm interested to hear why you all left back when you were 13. Take us back. What was happening in your life at the time? You're a teenager, so it's already a difficult time in your life. And now you're facing going to a completely new country. Yes. And I would love to 
talk about what's happening because it's it's obviously in the news and it's it's been impacting so many people, including myself. And, and I'm, so, uh, obviously, I'm I'm on the other side of the world now. But yes, so but before that, which definitely we we will talk about. Um, I came to the United States as a refugee. There was a huge exodus in the late '80s, early '90s of, of people from the former Soviet Union, and that includes people from. Russia, Uzbekistan, Ukraine, Moldova, like all former Soviet republics. I came as a, basically because um, of anti-Semitism. I'm Jewish, my family is Jewish, but also of uh, political instability. The United Soviet Union has just collapsed and took all of its like economic systems along with it. There was huge inflation, there was poverty. I mean, people were like getting assaulted left and right just for like earrings or leather jackets. There was huge, uh, there was a huge alcoholism problem. Did you see all this as a child? Or I did, yeah. Like you're a teenager, so is it like, wait a minute, I want to stay here. Like, did you, I don't want to move. Or were you like, oh gosh, let's move. You know, I actually did not want to move. Um, I think it's because of my age. I, I saw those things happening. Mm -hmm. I saw like teachers wearing their ski boots to teach because they couldn't afford it. I saw like older, like war veterans of World War II, like pedaling in the street there like ink pens or their war medals because they just wanted to buy food. And mm. we had people come to our building and regularly put little letters into every mailbox saying, I will take care of you until you die. And then I will inherit your apartment. So they wanted to like prey on older citizens. Mm. And obviously you can probably imagine like how long would they actually take care of that person before inheriting their apartment, right? Mm -hmm. It was, it was a really hard time. I used to like walk, see like drunk people on the street or like laying down, you know, all, all kinds of horror stories, obviously rationing food, but didn't. Like one of the things I describe in the book is I would um, obviously stand in line for bread, for, um, you know, sour cream. I mean, lines are pretty normal that, that I grew up with, but especially at the end of the the lifespan of the Soviet Union, we started having them rationed. So we'd be giving coupons. Like you can only buy like this amount of grams of like sour cream or flour and mm. we would stand in line, but the store could still run out. So that's something I would do after school a lot of times. And I remember this horrible incident when I was carrying this jar of sour cream back from the store after school and I like dropped it and it shattered in like tiny little pieces on the doorstep of the apartment building where we lived. And I don't think the sour cream was rationed, but it was still often not available. The rationing was like for flour and sugar. See, I'm trying to make it more positive for you. <laughs> sour cream did not have coupons for it. Uh, as in like, <laughs> Actually, yeah. we had sour cream. Well, we it was amazing. Except yeah. it was like really li liquid sour cream because it would all, the, the store, um, the store workers would often like take the sour cream and then they would like dilute it. Uh, so it was yeah. like really liquid, um, to make it last longer. And right. I remember like my mother came home from work and she was like, as soon as I saw the sour cream broken into tiny pieces, I thought that might be you because I asked you to do it. And she wasn't saying it to make me feel guilty, but I was just horrified. Mm -hmm. And of course, anti-Semitism. I, I think mm -hmm. I was spared. Like you asked me about, like, did I perceive those problems? I saw it happen, yeah. but I did not necessarily see it as this structural political problem because I think I was more focused on my own life, my friendships, you know, school crushes, uh, my piano performance that was coming up because I've lived in my building and I've had the same friends since I was like six years old and I've planted the trees outside my building when it was just constructed this like 12 story apartment building with my dad. I've known like every nook and cranny there. I, when I went back to visit in 2004, I still saw my name that I scrawled with my friend on the doorstep by the entrance. It's still mm. there, which kind of tells you how maintenance goes, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I was a child and nobody painted over it, like, uh, come on guys, it's time to paint. Yeah. So it's, I didn't, I actually did not want to leave. I had a lot of strong attachments to my apartment, to my room, to my friends, to my teachers, um, to my relatives. But you did have to move and you, yeah. and you all moved to California in the early nineties. And I kind of stereotype California as being a place of immigration, a place of immigrants. And in your book, you report how it wasn't really a very welcoming place for immigrants when you got there in the nineties. Yes. Yes. And no. So of course, when we came, so I just came with my brother and my parents and we received huge support. Obviously, we came as refugees, so we received some government support for a little bit, obviously not for long, but my parents, they had to relearn new skills, new trades. Uh, although my father continued working in his field, but he couldn't find a job what for was a very his long field, time. By the way? And then he worked on the, the night shift. It was, um, he was an engineer. Oh, okay. 
in in uh, the Soviet Union. Yeah. So at one point we ran out of all of our savings and we barely had enough money to buy tickets back home. But I think mm -hmm. this is something I learned later because I was still young. Mm -hmm. But later it turned out that we ran out like pretty much of all money and we had this tiny rental apartment like with furniture from the street that we found or that was donated to us. And we ran out and we were about to like ask maybe to, to go back home because we, we couldn't continue staying. We, we just couldn't afford it mm. anymore. And then he found a job uh, at a like on the night shift, like uh, measuring something like this minimum wage job. And then he and my mom kept learning English and um, like learning new skills, rereading their books that they read in, you know, Russian to reading them in English again so they could be employable. We came as refugees, so we had a little bit of help from the government for a short period of time. Also, some local Jewish organizations really helped us, you know, with donations and, and stuff like that. You know, I, I, it was immediately placed in ESL classes, so there were a lot of really devoted teachers teaching kids. Um, the school I went to was had a lot of immigrants from, I would say, from Mexico, from Central America, from Asia. Um, just a couple from the former Soviet Union, not too many, but there were just a handful. Uh, but at the same time, when I came, there was this Prop 187. Um, the governor of California wanted to, and actually was was rallying to pass uh, this law, this proposition that would ban undocumented immigrants from receiving any kind of services, including public education and medical care. And he spent a lot of money and a lot of effort to make sure that he convinced voters to do that. Like seeing like these videos in black and white of the quote unquote illegals running across the border and then this like Lay, mm -hmm. overlay of the voice like they're coming mm. so there was this like fear mongering of it against immigrants and also there was just the huge recession in california right before around the time they came so you know it's almost like almost like also a need of having somebody to blame mm -hmm. you know that wasn't necessarily you know we came as refugees so we had documentation but you can't help but like personalize it and think that that's maybe that's relating to you as well because you're also an immigrant like what do you know as a kid like who is documented and who isn't and I'd imagine mm -hmm. that a lot of um, American-born like adults felt skeptical about a lot of immigrants. Um, certainly, mm -hmm. we were asked, you know, when we're we going back home. You know, asked about our allegiances. I had a teacher that I described in the book who was a history teacher, social social studies, who was teaching the ESL section of the class. So all the kids were from somewhere else, and he had a sticker on his like above the the board, which again, I didn't know what it meant, but I learned, I realized later, I remembered the words It said like, welcome to California. Now go back home. So I didn't, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, that's just a sticker. But obviously that was like, you know, like you don't belong here. And he had this really yeah. nasty Oh, you attitude. meant the home like far away home. Okay. I, yeah, yeah. I don't this mean was, like Texas I mean, or like, you know, back sticker. to Portland. Yeah. Right, right. And he just, he was like incredibly angry. Like he would always tell the kids to stop speaking Mandarin. He would like roll his eyes. We would have, I described that also in the book. There's like announcements like, hey guys, why don't you try out for the football team? Or why don't you audition for the school play? And he'd be like, ah, as if you guys care about like sports or plays and just like talk in your language mm -hmm. all the time. So he was like really mean. He was an exception. I would say there were so many kind people that helped us. But, you know, when you're surrounded with that kind of attitude every day, you can't help but kind of somehow feel responsible for his anger or like that you did something wrong or that you're, or that you're less than. And you don't know any better when you're a child. There's a quote here where you say, it's hard to stay mentally present in an unfamiliar world. Nostalgia tethers you to the past worry pulls you into the future so you're just trying to be a teenager but you've got this memory of where you came from that's kind of pulling you back toward the past you're also worried about your future so you're kind of focused on what's coming ahead which makes it really hard for a teenager to just stay in the moment yeah i had a rough time and by the way my book is not like all very i mean it's 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 got a lot of heavy parts to it but there are some i would like to think funny parts yeah it's not all yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we'll, we'll get to that i want to depress people out of the gate i feel <laughs> podcast listeners like to get real sad you know okay well i can i can bring that on especially you know i grew up reading tolstoy and dostoevsky for fun so. <laughs> right right <laughs> yeah I, I can i can bring that um so yeah i had a i had a rough time immigrating. Um, I mean, first of all, like I said, I had all my community there. When we moved into our apartment, it was still like these like planks, like b bits of cement and there was like still water inside. It was just built and we made it what it was, you know, we decorated it. We planted all the plants and we, when we moved, we, we like left the entire apartment home. We like sold some things, donated some things in secret because we couldn't tell anybody we were leaving because if somebody found out that somebody's immigrating, that meant that they have cash 
or dollars. And that's a sign that it's lying around. You can just come and take it, right? So there was a lot of crime. And then, yeah, whatever we didn't sell, including plants and the piano, which, as I found out later, the piano that I used to grow up, or that I grew up playing, actually belonged to a ballerina who apparently had it with her during the siege of Leningrad during World War II. And so it, oh, wow. it survived. It survived that. And I love that piano. So we left that. We left everything. And I remember that moment of like moving on the platform at night. We took a train to the other city and then to go to the airport. And all my family was like outside waving. Um, we never knew if we would ever actually see them again. Mm -hmm. And my friends that I've known for pretty much my whole life were the night before we had like a get together. They all walked me home. They gave me pictures of themselves, little souvenirs, like some crocheted little chickens or a little teddy bear, uh, signed pictures. It was, it was really hard because I told them like the day before that I was leaving, I couldn't say it earlier. Mm. I, I was heartbroken. And when I came, I didn't speak English. Like obviously like no talk of fashion when you're poor, you know, when you wear donated clothes and mm -hmm. there's like some emblems, like oh, the Fresno, oh. whatever, like marathon from 1986. And people ask you, oh, did you run that marathon? <laughs> like, yeah. Like what marathon? You don't really think of coordinating colors or like wearing Gap, which I remember like Gap was a big thing at the time when I came. Everybody had those like bags with yeah. Gap on it. Um, to me, that was like very aspirational thing. Yeah. yeah so it was, it was, it was tough. It was tough. And, it, and actually a lot of immigrants I spoke to that came uh, when they were teenagers, maybe even earlier, they report like having these like almost like a blackout moments. They don't remember much during the time. It's almost like they blocked it out of their mind, mm. um, the adjustment. And writing this book has, has been an incredibly, incredibly curative, like therapeutic thing for me as well. Um, so, and I hope that it can be helpful to readers too. I read, for example, um, this social psychologist, John Barry, who basically talked about the various ways people can adapt to a new culture because we usually think, oh, you know, immigrants just come and they assimilate and then they just become like everybody else, which of course, what does it mean everybody else? Right. But we talked about this very complex tapestry of America and what, you know, how many cultures and races and, and ethnicities it represents. But typically that's been like the golden like measure of you know, success as an immigrant, you assimilate. But uh, John Barry said it's not true. There are many different ways you can adapt to a new culture. You can reject it. You can just embrace it, assuming you're not experiencing any xenophobia. You can reject both cultures and just withdraw completely. Or you can adapt both and become bicultural, which tends to be like the healthiest. But one other thing that John Barry also says is that adolescents tend to have the toughest time adapting to a new culture, also older generations too, like um, grandparents, for example, but adolescents certainly. And I was reading that and I was like, yeah, you know, that's interesting. I try not to think about that period of my life, but I kind of had a rough time there. Mm. <laughs> yeah. As we're reading your personal stories, you also place it in the broader context of American immigration. And, you know, we have the Statue of Liberty, which is supposed to symbolize hope and welcoming the poem on the statue says, bring your poor huddled masses yearning to be free. There's this really aspirational thing. But of course, the history is much different. And you lay this out early on in the book about the way that the United States both needed and feared immigrants, that there was this tension that existed there, that in the 19th century, there weren't a lot of restrictions. But then in the early 20th century, a lot of these restrictions were put in place. There was economic instability, a lot of nativist backlash, basically poor people feeling like immigrants were competing with them for jobs and all of these things. And you're a teenager and you're just trying to, try, you know, you're just trying to like not stick out and look weird and have weird clothes and sound weird and have people judging you for that. And it's again, it's when you're coming of age. So it makes sense to me when I read, you know, as you're reporting that a lot of teenagers, a lot of adolescents don't lock in a lot of memories from that time. It's a really unstable, unsettling time. So That's right. We're talking with Masha Rumer. She's an award-winning journalist and a freelance writer. And we're talking about the book Parenting with an Accent. All right. I want to talk about the beat test. Um, <laughs> this is a chapter about getting married. And you say that about one in seven marriages today in the United States is either interracial or interethnic, which one in seven, that's a pretty high number. Uh, you also point to statistics that suggest that immigrants are 30 times more likely to marry other immigrants. So a lot more likely to marry other immigrants. As you were coming of age to date and to think about getting married, did you have aspirations? Were you aiming for something in particular? <laughs> the knight on the, in the shining armor, right? Um, <laughs> no, I, I would say 
probably not. I, I think I went through a period also when I came when, that I rejected everything related to my culture just because it was so traumatic. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't really kind of hang out in the um, circles from my homeland. Um, yeah. I, so my husband is American from Ohio. <laughs> Definitely not Russian or, 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 or Jewish. I, I think one thing I've learned from doing this research and talking to many multicultural families, you know, whether they are both from the same country or part of the country or from different places. And then also talking to psychologists and reading is it's really not about where the partner is from. It's all just about how they respect one another's backgrounds and traditions. Um, I've, I've asked this very question. Is it harder if you were an immigrant to date, non-immigrants or just to date in general? Yeah, there's certain levels, extra levels of complexity that, that are attached to it because it brings it to, to light of like, you know, what do people consider beautiful? Um, are there specific, you know, religion-based restrictions? But it's also something we often see, you know, within the United States uh, among people that were born here, you know, different religions, different uh, political beliefs. So it's not necessarily that different <laughs> being, you know, dating other immigrants and marrying them. But there is also, there's a level of complexity, especially when it comes to families, because sometimes people from another culture might not want to be with those from their own background, because maybe they see them as quote, unquote undesirable since they want to like step away from that. Mm -hmm. Um, especially if they see pictures of like destructions or, or poverty back home. This is something that I, I've also had a chance to speak with Professor Nasli Kibria, who teaches at Boston University. She, um, in sociology, she did a lots of amazing research uh, specifically on the Bangladeshi diaspora. But at the same time, there's also this pool that your community wants you to stay within your own community. It is literally an issue of survival of life and death, because if you're like marrying out of the culture, you're, you know, maybe compromising the language, the traditions, the certainly the, the religious aspects of it. And of course, I, I would say that, you know, my parents initially probably expected me to be with somebody like myself, but hmm. then they eventually saw that wasn't happening. <laughs> they, just, they just wanted somebody nice with a good job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Expectations can get tempered pretty quick. So you mentioned that you kind of pulled away from your culture. You felt you wanted to sort of get away from that for a while, but you really boomeranged back to fall back in love with and appreciate your heritage. And this is where the beat test comes into it. So describe this, this kind of thing that you, that people that you would date had to kind of go through. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a great question. So the, the beat test I described, like I didn't actually have this like beat test, like the you know, people tell you the checklist. It wasn't like written out yeah, or anything. Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe <laughs> yeah. in the back of my mind. So I, I think it, it was very important for me to try to find somebody who appreciates or understands my heritage. It didn't have to be somebody from my heritage, but uh, just somebody that I got along with and, um, you know, shared my values. And one of them was food. The Soviet Union has a very rich. There's some interesting dishes. Yeah, there are some interesting dishes. And I mean, there's also the, the Russian heritage. And of course, the Soviet Union was like the, the output and, you know, economy was greatly controlled by the government. Um, there was such a scarcity of food always. We had this book, a culinary book that was like one book about healthy and delicious food. And it had a lot of pictures in it that were like really sumptuous pictures. A lot of it was like a can of peas and it's like this close-up, this dramatic close-up of peas out of a can oh, or wow. like dishes that most of us have never even heard of because that didn't really exist. We had very little food. Obviously there was World War II and poverty because of that. There was also Holodomor where Stalin basically starved millions of Ukrainians, mm -hmm. like millions of them died. It was an act of genocide. So it's, we're kind of seeing a continuation. Yeah, he manufactured a famine in order to... In order, yeah, yeah it, it was like to destroy a people. Um, and that was part of it. There was like literally no food to eat. Mm. So there was very little food and we had to get really creative with what we had. I remember when the pandemic started, I was like, we can handle it because like you can have this canned tuna or like canned <laughs> whatever and use it in these five different ways. So really creative and we had to have holidays and, you know, celebrations. So you had canned food, you had to get really aggressively like creative with what you can do with a boiled potato, right? Or you <laughs> yeah. can have a soup made of pickles. And traditionally even like, even dating back, like, you know, there's a lot of food in Eastern Europe basically consists of like soups. You kind of like have all of them for nutrition. You have like cabbage, potato, these are your carrot, and these are your staples. And so the beet test was, I have this really weird salad that I love that I grew up eating. It's called herring under a fur coat. 
It's super weird. People either love it or hate it. Uh, yeah. But it's there. The name of it gets me, I have to admit. It's, yeah, I have to probably describe what it looks like. The herring under a fur coat. <laughs> you can probably imagine a little fish walking around in this like sable coat. But but it's not. It's like a layered salad, which I think was like a thing in the United States too for some time. Layered salads or like these things. Yeah, and jello salads jello. too, which were different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which which I think is so cool. <laughs> Um, I know it's maybe not not like the, 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 all the rage right now, but so it's it's a it's a layer of like pickled herring covered with like bits of onion, and then there's like a layer of mayonnaise. Mayonnaise is present in just about everything in the Soviet <laughs> cuisine because it's available and it makes things delicious and creamy, and it makes you like. It full. still is. I had a pizza in when we visited Russia. We ordered a pizza because I wanted some American food after several weeks. I was like, I've got to have something American. Sure. We ordered this pizza, and I get two slices into it, and I'm like realize after that that oh something's off and there was no pizza sauce it was mayonnaise oh my right. goodness sorry to interrupt no I, I love it that. was a mayonnaise pizza so yeah i'm, I'm so googling that after after the, this this episode that's amazing I, I really want that i think i'm gonna try to make it because i have to say my <laughs> daughter eats tri-state mayonnaise from a jar i think it's genetic oh wow unless i stop her um so yeah so then there's like a mayonnaise layer then there's grated potatoes mayonnaise layer grated carrots and then like at the top you get like beets grated beets so it's this beautiful magenta color again layered with mayonnaise so it almost looks kind of like a ufo but like bright magenta and on a plate <laughs> that's the the beet test is kind of uh, it's named after the salad the herring under fur coat with the beets eventually I, I realized that the people that i was kind of dating didn't always take well to my cuisine um you know there was like <laughs> yeah. an italian person that i was dating briefly who made fun of this salad with canned peas saying that they're capers and that they grow them in Sicily and I was like no it's actually peas and it's a very traditional salad that we eat at every holiday and he was like no it's capers it's a caper so no and I was like this is not going to work out sorry dude <laughs> there were other issues right of course and then there was this other somebody from Israel who just could not understand the cuisine and he actually kind of made fun of it like he thought boiled chicken was disgusting which I don't disagree with he like couldn't understand why there aren't so many spices because in the Middle East, people have a lot more spices. Right. And yeah, and so the kind of the list goes on. And, and then eventually I took my husband to a restaurant in Midtown Manhattan and we ordered that herring under for coat. And it was put in front of him and I already really liked him. And I was like, oh my God, I hope he likes the salad. I hope he doesn't start making fun of it. Which is not just about yeah. like, you don't have to like it. You should at least like not disrespect it, right? Especially if it's something so dear to you. And he was like, hmm, that tastes like my mother's cooking. And I was like, yes. So I ordered another thing and the waiter brought that <laughs> and he liked that too, or at least pretended to. And then at the end, I asked the, I, I, I asked the waiter to take her photo um, because I was like, I think this is going to work out. And then we used that picture um, when, I, when I announced their engagement later oh, on, wow. on Facebook. I think this the yeah. after shortly after. You're not necessarily expecting him to like it, but I think it signaled on his part an openness and yeah. and a regard for you as a person. I think you, you pr once you get to know somebody, there might like you know you can kind of joke about some stuff and stuff of like course. that. But early on in a relationship, I think it just signaled kind of an openness and a willingness to try things and that would help make for a more successful relationship, especially an intercultural relationship like that. And as you were talking to other couples who had who had gotten married what are some of the challenges that that they talked about that they face in inter-ethnic marriages you know they the thing is they they don't really that's the thing i i thought there would be like a host of because i i kind of do it like organically you know here's this person from a different culture we kind of try to make it work but they didn't really talk about a lot of cultural issues they were just the basic stuff of life like you know, the troubles they would have had, like mm -hmm. one Brazilian woman who married somebody from Syria and they were both just heartbroken when there was a, a war and this huge refugee crisis in Syria. They were, so they were just worried about the family there. Maybe both of them say they mispronounce the same words in the same way because they're both non-native language English speakers. The religion was a big deal. Uh, for example, one person is of one religion, the other one is of another. How do we balance that? But again, that can happen anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. But there were not that many, I would say, challenges that I've seen people come across when they already married. I think it's a lot of it was just the stuff of life, like religion, maybe, you know, fertility problems and, and challenges. Like, but that has nothing to do with immigration, right? Or in-laws that are trying to like butt in and give advice. I mean, but I think also like, there was a couple I spoke to. The woman was born in the United States and the husband was from Mexico and his mom 
came when their child was born and then a little bit later. And she had a lot of ideas of how the child should be really bundled up all the time, um, really warm. Right. But the wife was worried that the child might get overheated because she read the American Academy of Pediatrics does not allow, does not recommend bundling because that might lead to like the SIDS or something. So she was always really worried. Right. Um, or there were some like tinctures that she would bring or certain ways of binding the belly. And she, she didn't understand why to do that. But again, it's, is it really related to immigration or is it just a cultural proclivity? So things like that. I think it just all comes down to respect and willingness to be open and not, you know, and I think a lot of the people I spoke to, they didn't even share, speak the language of their partner necessarily. That's not the deal breaker. It's all about respect and understanding where the person comes from and just trying to make it work. And speaking of language, part of your book focuses specifically on the issue of language in families. And so more than half of the world, you point out, is bilingual. So it actually surprised me to find out that a lot of second generation immigrants, so children, like you, you would be a second generation, you're, right? Your parents immigrated over and, or I guess your children are second generation. My right? children like, are second generation. So I'm first, okay. but I'm very close to being generation 1.5. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So you're kind of in between yeah. there. Yeah. It doesn't fall along these neat lines, but the point is that, that language gets lost really quick. And that surprised me that, that a lot of parents find that it's, it's actually can be difficult to pass language on and children don't necessarily grow up bilingual. So what was your experience with that and thinking about being a parent? And I, I would imagine you would want your children to speak your native language there. That's where you're more, you feel most comfortable speaking. You can really convey your feelings most that way. So talk a little bit about that, about being a parent and, and worrying maybe even a little bit about language. It was a huge issue for me to, um, I didn't really plan on like how I'm going to pass down my language to my children when my daughter was born, it just never really occurred to me. I think I just assumed it would just kind of happen. You know, like you just learn to talk and if at least one parent in the household speaks a language, the child's gonna just automatically just like kind of babble in it and then just be native, almost like a native speaker, which is absolutely ridiculous and, and not true as I learned. One of the most kind of humbling things I, I've learned from talking to other parents and, and, and researching is that historically and now it takes like three generations for the native language to disappear. So the first generation of folks that people that come from abroad, they speak it, their kids usually are bilingual, typically more or less. And then their grandkids do not speak it at all. And this has been the case like a hundred years ago or a little over a hundred years ago with a, you know, great wave of European migration. And it's certainly the case now. So immigrants are losing their native languages and are gaining English at the same speed. Certainly there are exceptions, but that's kind of the general trend. And that shocked me. When my daughter was born, I found myself speaking exclusively in my language with her because I just could not find any other way to be authentic. Um, it just kind of came flooding. I, I could not speak English with her at all. I tried and it just felt completely inauthentic. Yeah, you said it didn't even seem like a choice. It just like, this is how you spoke. Yeah, which is really strange because again, I was 13 when I moved and I thought that, you know, I'm, a, I'm pretty fluent in English at this point, I would say I taught it. Um, I, it's kind of, it was a really weird, yeah. um, rude awakening, but there was a language just coming out and it seemed like the only way I could, I could talk to her. And I did, um, certainly, but when she went to, and the same happened to my son, when they went to American daycares, they became a lot less fluent in my language. And there is a lot of resources and a lot of time that's needed to maintain the native language. But it, it is possible, but it, it's not going to be perfect. You would say even resistance too. You talk about your daughter sometimes, like you would be speaking in Russian or maybe doing Russian stories or something. And she was like, no, stop, do English. That's right. That's right. There's so much resistance. And of course, like the, the tendency is for the parent to feel, oh, maybe, you know, I'm not doing something right. Or they're unwilling to learn my language. And it's, it feels like actually it's really kind of hurtful to a parent, no matter what language that is mm -hmm. and where they come from. It's, I remember I was trying to play for one of my kids this song, a holiday song that I grew up with that's that's very old and that kids used to listen to around every holiday season and she was like yeah not into that you know can we just listen to daddy's jingle bells <laughs> and I was so hurt I remember oh, just yeah. going to the grocery store later like um and oh. I was like almost in tears I think I was, I was uh, it, it felt yeah. like and it wasn't like yeah oh, I'm not listening to mommy or like you know they didn't eat their vegetables it was so right. much deeper it's it's about the link to the heritage. It's mm -hmm. about the jokes, the songs, the ability to speak to the grandparents and great grandparents. It's uh, all the family that's still there. 
they're gonna hopefully get to meet one day and it just feels like a huge rejection of, of you like when when a child does not it seems like does not want to speak it but little did i know that it's actually a very common phenomenon because ta-da, kids want to be like everybody else i had a very similar experience when i immigrated mm -hmm. and when they hear other peers speak english and not their native languages they kind of don't want to really stand out it's not a personal thing it's just i just want to fit in and also maybe they just don't know the language as well yet they can't express themselves as comfortably so of course they're going to switch into english if they're more comfortable and more supported in that but it's not the end of the world and um, as i've mentioned in the book there are so many resources out there to try to help maintain the language there are multiple ways it can be done you know one parent speaks one language the other one speaks the other which is not i have to say what i do in my household because it's very difficult and very regimented but people mm -hmm. to do it like one parent one language approach and it has about notably about a 75 percent success rate but even the word success is a little fuzzy um based on research because what does <laughs> like it mean you know by bi like bilingual does it mean that they can you know speak and read and write in all those languages native like um can they swear in it <laughs> also very important <laughs> so it, it depends um but i've as the more i learned and the more i kind of persevered and tried different things the more i was able to find an approach that works for me and that's what a lot of parents do some are more strict than others uh, but it forcing a child to speak a language doesn't usually work. Yeah, they might start rejecting it and it, it's all very individual, but just because a child is not into speaking the language, it doesn't mean it's the end of the world. And there are ways to maintain bilingualism at home, even if you're just the only person in the household that speaks it. It's just gonna be a bit more challenging, but the support, society support and external support like outside of the house is incredibly important. And you talk about some of the myths too. You clear up some of the myths that people wonder about, like if, if it will cause speech delays to try to have bilingual children, whether it confuses children. And you clear up a lot of those that it doesn't cause speech delays. It, it's not confusing. Children are very good at, at doing all this. Have you seen over time, uh, over the four years of writing the book, did your daughter become has, will she listen to the song now how <laughs> absolutely she loves those songs and so does my son oh good um, i think there was a period of time when i actually gave up speaking not not speaking my language with her i was just um i kind of put it on hold because i tried to speak to her mm -hmm. and she just i mean she was like two and at that time i was working so much mm -hmm. i i hardly saw her during the day on weekdays and the last thing I wanted was to not communicate with her or like have some rules about how she can speak to me. You know, um, I mean, some, some families do it, you know, that that's fine for them, but I, I just did not want to do that. So I switched to English, but at the same time, I still had, you know, the cartoons. I offered her like the plenty of books in my language that were available, you know, we socialized with my friends and, and peers that had kids that spoke that language too. We saw my, my parents who certainly speak, you know, the language certainly not every weekend, but quite a bit. And it was still in the background. And she eventually, I would say maybe a year later, came back to it and she showed interest. And that's when I saw my opportunity. When I taught her to read and write um, and speak. You know, she wasn't necessarily completely fluent at the time and certainly English is more comfortable. But later on, she started taking lessons. So I was not the only source of the language. And mm -hmm. as she took lessons, she didn't just learn about how to speak it. She learned about the culture and she saw other kids speaking in it. And it was less weird and less right. unusual. And there's a different authority figure too to have a teacher doing it rather than a parent I think can probably even make a difference exactly and and it's documented that the more external support there is the better coming from school coming from peers um, even if it's a babysitter or a nanny it's it's it all really really helps and it doesn't always happen right away you know a person can become bilingual at any age you know even there there might be an accent present certainly but of course the the most opportune time to learn is, you know, during childhood, like the early years of childhood. But, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's everybody has their own approach. That's Masha Rumor. She's an award-winning journalist and a freelance writer. We're talking about her new book, Parenting with an Accent. She's also been published in places like the New York Times, the Washington Post and elsewhere. Masha, your book appears at a time when it seems like xenophobia is more publicly pronounced than perhaps before. We've Part of it's my own privilege that I've been ignorant to how persistent racism and xenophobia have been, but also it does seem like we see more of it on social media, we see more of it in the news, and people are more likely to film it and put it up so we can see these things happening. Have you felt that? you're Being an immigrant, you, you have a bit of an accent. Do you run into xenophobia? Has it felt more pronounced? You know, I guess one part of my answer will be pre-war because right now, you know, as we're speaking, it's been about a month since Putin invaded Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I've seen that um, 
you know, again, it, it depends also on what kind of immigrant it is. And I, Blair, I just so appreciate all the work you do to bring those issues to light that you've mentioned. It's so critical to have a better understanding of it and, and to know how, how hard you work to, to discuss them and to make sure those issues are seen of xenophobia, mm. racism, of inequities. Um, in my case, I've, I've certainly run into it. I've had people ask me, when am I going back home? Ask me if I'm really a citizen or like, did I steal elections uh, in the United States? Um, like I've had people imply like, why did I marry my husband? Did I do it for a visa or something? But it doesn't happen very often. I did, of course, apply to teach English uh, when I was in graduate school at a private school. Like they, when they found out I wasn't born in the United States, they suggested that I better, I'm better off teaching my own language instead. Oh, wow. Certainly. Yeah, I certainly had that happen. And, and it's amazing too. I just want people to know, like I've followed your writing for years and you are a fantastic writer. You're fantastic in the English language. And to confront that sort of prejudice is so frustrating because you, you are skilled. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's very kind of you to say. I, 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 Certainly there, there are ways I can st still improve, I, I would think. I, I think it's a lot harder, particularly with some people I spoke to. And especially since I wrote this book when we had a different president. Yes, um, exactly so. In the White yes. House. And we saw we saw a very, not, not perceived, but very documented increase in hate crimes and um, right. prejudicial statements against immigrants or pretty much anyone who is, who is different. I mean, it's, I mean, I mean, the whole campaign, the presidential campaign was built on anti-immigrant rhetoric, hmm. right? How they send us the worst from Mexico, so mm -hmm. to speak. And who, you know, the, I'm not going to say yes. the word, the S whole countries, right? Like how, how immigrants come from there. Yes. So it's like unbelievable. Yeah. And I want to say too, I want to be really clear. The fact is it's not an exaggeration to say that racism and xenophobia were a significant part of the campaign and that many people who voted for that president shared those sentiments or at the very least, those sentiments were not disqualifying, which is itself xenophobic and racist. People who would say, oh, well, I don't agree with that and that, but it was still not a big enough deal. It wasn't a deal breaker, which itself is a manifestation of racism and xenophobia. That's, that's exactly right. Thank you for saying that. The people that I interviewed actually reported to me they felt unsafe. Um, there was a woman who is Indian and uh, brown skinned. Her husband is Indian. They have adopted two girls who are born here who are white, Caucasian. And she said she was really concerned how people are going to look at the family because mm. of that. And are they going to think that she is not part of this culture? And I mean, I've had I've sp spoken to an, a number of other people that are also mentioned in this book where they, you know, they, they, they had their partners like asked if they married for a visa and why don't they speak English well, even though they knew that the partner speaks mm -hmm. English well or when are they going back home? So it's uh, unfortunate, it certainly affects us. Just like I mentioned, when I came to, to the United States, there was this anti-immigrant sentiment from Pete Wilson, the governor at the time. It affects people. It, it, it's not a direct kind of a like cause and effect, but it, it absolutely trickles down. And whatever is said in the media, in, you know, mm -hmm. by our policymakers and politicians, it certainly affects people's mindsets. Um, and we see that changing people's minds and the, how they think even if it's not true, like, yeah, immigrants do not come from as whole countries uh, and they do not send us, you know, offenders and, and, and criminals contrary to what was said uh, during that presidential platform. But it does make people feel afraid for their safety. It does absolutely hamper immigrants assimilation or culturation efforts, because in order for a person to assimilate, they have to feel like the society receiving them is open to them and is accepting them and mm -hmm. is not xenophobic, is not racist, That's right. is not judging them or rejecting them or fearing them. That's very important. It's, it's understandable. People do fear anyone who is different. That's just how people are made. But if you have that kind of throwing like coals into the fire or whatnot, it's going to affect the way people are received. And it's especially I have to say, especially affects people who are undocumented mm -hmm. because they are afraid, even, even kids of parents who came undocumented, who might not even know about their undocumented status until they grow a little bit older and they have to apply for like financial aid or go to school or get a li driver's license. They don't even know that they are documented and it creates so much fear. Those people are less likely to seek help when they need it, medical care. Uh, legal help when certainly they might need it. It creates a culture of fear and distrust and, and violence, th this kind of rhetoric. 
I wanted to talk a little bit now about what's happening. I was at a presentation yesterday where some Ukrainians and Russians spoke about their backgrounds and what's happening right now. And the Russian speaker really stood out to me. She talked about loving her country, but feeling so disappointed and sad and almost guilty uh, of what Russia was doing. And she would contact her family back in Russia and say, this is what's happening. And they wouldn't even believe her. They've been watching state media. They aren't aware of all of the things that Russia is doing. And so as I was preparing for this interview, I obviously couldn't help but think of you. I know you came over when you were 13, but this is where you came from. You, so I just I, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that and what you've been going through as the war uh, Russia against Ukraine has been unfolding. It's been very hard. Um, I am in a complete state of shock to be honest. Um, mm. I came from Russia. I'm part Ukrainian. Both of my grandmothers are from Ukraine. They grew up there. Uh, I have Ukrainian family now who like part of my family, they're from Odessa. <laughs> At the time the war broke out, I had my cousin's family in Kiev and they had to evacuate. So mm. I have relatives still in Russia that are absolutely opposed to this invasion, to this horrible invasion. And one was jailed for protesting war. It's unconscionable for, for, for so many reasons. I am ashamed. I mean, they're, it's like the infrastructure in the country Ukraine is like, they're, it's partly destroyed. Uh, it, it's not about, is it going to be rebuilt? There's now mm -hmm. more than three and a half million people who are refugees who have fled Ukraine, including my family members and millions of others that are displaced internally. And, and it's horrible. At the same time, Putin's, um, like the Iron Curtain is back upon us, I'm afraid, and on, on Russia because the thousands of anti-war protesters are being detained. Some of them are being violently treated and abused in detention. It's documented. There's like Human Rights Watch actually documented this physical abuse against those who are taken to the streets saying no to war, no to war. In my family's case, the wife did not know what was happening to the man. Like she knew where he was taken, but they were not given information about when he's going to be released. They would not take packages from her. Again, it's not the same as people being bombed in Ukraine, but there are so many people in Russia that are aghast about this. And media, independent media has been silenced. Access online has been blocked. A lot of it has been dissolved. I know liberal Western journalists I follow from Russia, a lot of them have fled Russia as well. They're no longer reporting from there. Um, and if you basically say anything against the war or call it war or call it invasion instead of special operation, that's even use the word, even words, using yeah. the words war invasion, like that can give you a sentence of up to 15 years in jail. And who knows what's going to happen to you there. Russia has a history of repression historically. I, I can, I, I do not know what's going to happen. I know that people in Russia are being brainwashed. Also, Facebook is no longer available. In, I think Instagram too, but Twitter is no longer available. So people cannot even share what's going on or even understand what's going on. The majority of people do not speak English. So they're just being brainwashed and fed this information mm -hmm. about a special operation. They're being told that Ukraine. Yeah, when it's the yeah. only media you can access, yep. that's the only story you have to even judge. So they have no, they do not know what's going on. They're being told that the soldiers, they're just a couple of hundred soldiers killed so far, whereas in fact, it's in the thousands and nobody's taking them to bury them back in Russia. A lot of times the mothers do not know, the, the wives do not know where their husbands are. Like nobody can identify them because nobody's coming to collect them. That's a huge problem. Do you think a reckoning is coming at least because of that? The fact that people aren't going to be coming, like there's going to be a lot of people that don't come back from this. And how are everyday Russians that don't have access to this kind of information going to even learn about it eventually? You know, I, I do not know. Uh, I, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, Russia has a really long history of burying facts. Uh, the Holocaust was not discussed for my family. My um, Ukrainian and my Belarusian family perished also. Mm. They were killed by the Nazis. The gulags were not discussed. And you think Russia yeah. would be trumpeting that yeah. because Russia ended up fighting Hitler and making a considerable difference in how World War II wound up. So you'd think that would be uh, something to be proud of. Well, that And that's the thing. A lot of people at the border now that are evacuating, they're sharing the exactly same stories 
their grandparents have shared about evacuating the Nazis, mm -hmm. uh, both Russian and Ukrainian. They were fighting side by side. Yeah. And like I said, my family is part Ukrainian. Yeah. So many other families I know that they have like one spouse is from Ukraine, others from Russia or both are, or my best friend in Russia was Ukrainian. Like she was born in a small village outside Zhutomir and she like, she told me all about it. Like when we were friends until, until I left. So I, I, I'm sorry, I can't be more, more eloquent about this, but I do not know about reckoning because people are afraid there's silence and there's, they're thinking that there's nothing really happening. There's just special operation and nobody's really dying. And the Russia is there to quote unquote, fight Nazism, denazify mm -hmm. Ukraine, which is like. Yes, there's a, you know, there's mm -hmm. a problem of white supremacy in Russia and Ukraine. I mean, as it is in the United States, right. obviously, but I'm sorry. Yeah, we have like a Jewish president uh, elected in a landslide in Ukraine. Right. There, Russia's just bombed the site of Babi Yar, where right. like over 30,000 Jews were shot in just a matter of a few days. The bombs fell on it. Like, how is that denazifying? It's shameful. It's mm -hmm. horrible. I know that people in Russia are already like, mm -hmm. they're running out of money or food, their medicine, they're not going to have my friend's mother is there also being brainwashed. She's going to have no access to medical equipment that she needs to stay alive very soon because it's Western because of all the sanctions. And of course there need to be sanctions. I, I can tell you also that it's just as an example of Russia's repressions. Um, my great aunt was digging ditches around when World War II started. She was digging ditches around Leningrad for the soldiers as it was being occupied by the Nazis. And she was taken as a prisoner of war by the Nazis for the duration of the war. And when she came out, she was put in the gulag by Stalin. So she, she, because she was a prisoner of war, it was a punishment for seeing the West. And she was there until Stalin died. Um, I also just found out two days ago, surprisingly, that my grandfather, my different grandfather, he served during the entire war. She was in the Air Force, an officer protected it from the Nazis. He changed his last name so that in case he was taken as a prisoner of war and later imprisoned or put in a camp by Stalin in Russia, that his family would not be punished for being a prisoner of war. So that's why he changed his last name. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a history of violence and repression by, mm. by people who run the country, sadly. And we're seeing that now and I just, I'm just praying and hoping if it's going to be, it's going to end as soon as possible. Thank you for spending a little bit of time on that. I know that's a really emotional and difficult topic and I appreciate you um, talking about it with us. Thank you. Thanks for asking about it. Masha, there's a, there's a lot of reflection in this book about feeling between worlds. You have a place where you came from um, and you're, you're in a new place that's also home. But there's a section toward the end of the book that I thought would be nice to hear you read to our listeners. So it's on page 168. Sure. Thank you. Having lived in the United States most of my life, I've raised dozen of champagne and vodka toasts to America at every major family function from New Year's Eve parties to birthdays. I've voted in every presidential election since becoming a citizen. I've baked flag cakes on 4th of July and for friends receiving their green cards. It's basically a frosted rectangular sheet cake festooned with strawberries and blueberries in a stars and stripes pattern. It's quite good. This is where my children were born and where I've lived most of my life. This is home, but no amount of patriotic cake and country music can erase that occasional feeling of statelessness. I wanted to hear you talk a little bit more about that feeling of statelessness and what that's like. It's really hard to pin down, but it's basically, I think the feeling of being between two cultures, it, it can feel like you're occupying them both at the same time, but also not really belonging to them either. Because on the one hand, you know, you're not completely American, you know, you might miss some references to, you know, it, it's beyond the just sports, you know, some references that people grew up with as kids, maybe some social cues or some um, understanding what is a smile? Is a smile like a genuine expression of goodwill or is it just part of, you know, a part, part of a message that's otherwise meant to be negative and the smile just makes it less negative? That's something a lot of immigrants struggle with mm -hmm. or words like, um, I don't love that or... I'm not sure I agree with that. Or maybe there's another way of looking at it. Is it somebody saying, okay, I agree with you, but maybe there are other ways of looking at it or I don't love it, but I like it. Or does it mean I hate this? <laughs> yeah. Because for example, where I grew up, like you have to be really straightforward. Like if you say, if you don't like it, you're going to say, I hate this, or this is ridiculous or crazy, which also I don't necessarily recommend, <laughs> but understanding how to read between the lines that can take a while. But at the same time, going back to my, you know, birthplace, I, I found myself 
also feeling like an outsider. Mm. I smile way more and like, you don't just smile at people in the former Soviet Union. They'll think something <laughs> is wrong with you or you're planning to steal <laughs> something from them or <laughs> you're just crazy. Um, that's also not considered okay. And, you know, I might have a bit of an accent maybe. Um, I don't know the latest like lingo and jargon in Russian. Um, although that also, that comes back pretty quickly, usually when you're immersed back in the culture. But, you know, I, when I went back in 2004 and met with my friends that I grew up with, that I've been dreaming about like their lives or being back there. And they always appear in the same age in my dreams that mm. they were 13. Um, interestingly. Yeah. Yeah. I looked at all those yearbooks they showed me like for those two days I saw them and I saw myself absent from those yearbooks and it was incredibly heartbreaking. And they talked to me about their jobs, their families or how they're trying to get families or struggling. And I felt like I didn't speak the same language. My problems were different problems from them. Obviously we could talk, we could reminisce, but I was already different and changed and they saw me as different and changed. It was quite tragic actually, even though I was really happy to, to see them. In the book, I also say, you know, maybe it takes time to see anything at all when you're of both cultures, but it really offers sometimes the best seats in the house. And hmm. that's how I like to look at it. And I think too, just the fact of parenting with an accent, it's almost to me as though you're also building a world with your children and with your spouse that doesn't have the same amount of disconnect. The world that your children are growing up in is their world, is their home. You're part of that. And I wonder if that helps make a difference too. the the fact of building a new world with children in the mix and and that home can really exist there. It's been incredibly empowering to try to, you know, build traditions from scratch, I would say for me and for my husband, too, who, like I mentioned, is not Russian. He, he's from the Midwest and he grew up very different, but also actually in many ways similar. I, I find there's a lot of overlap in ways we grew up from food we ate to how we you know, how we, people tend to approach conflict, whether mm. they discuss it or they're conflict averse and just the general demeanor. I, I think um, it just, we had a lot of similarities, but at the same time, we're negotiating from the very beginning. How are we going to celebrate holidays? Mm -hmm. How are we going to treat religion in our home? How am I going to treat my religion of my ancestors when I did not grow up with it? Because it was taboo. We were not, we were supposed to be atheists. We were supposed to be hiding our religions, whether it's Christianity or Judaism or, you know, being Muslim for people who were living more like in the Central Asian uh, republics. Um, right. But especially being Jewish was obviously a taboo because of anti-Semitism. But how am I now going to bring that back into my household after not really observed that or only seen that among really older family members that have not been with us for a long time who've changed their names to avoid persecution for being Jewish? And I only found out later. So how do I revive that in my family and in my household? And at the same time, honor my husband's roots and bring back my culture that I grew up with, that despite of what's happening now, the terrors that we're seeing, it's still the culture I grew up with. And mm -hmm. there's so many good things about its music, its writing, it's the people. And, and try to teach my kids that they're certainly seeing what's happening with the war and we're telling them about it and they're donating their tooth fairy money to causes. and. I don't want them to be ashamed of it, but I want them to be ashamed of Putin and know that this is not mm -hmm. what the country is and its people are. And it's a very hard task, especially now. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it is like we're building from scratch and um, it's, it's, it's really exciting and it's really empowering. And I get the sense throughout the book that it was healing for you to connect with people from a lot of different cultures who were experiencing a lot of similar things. It seemed like one of the main messages of the book was that a lot of the adversities that you faced being an immigrant and now being a parent aren't necessarily rooted in immigration itself, but are fairly common human things about communication and about trust and about nostalgia and about having a home and safety. And so that all of these human concerns, they happen to be played in the register of being an immigrant, but that you can find connections with people from a lot of different cultures that can resonate with you. Absolutely. So many of these issues are, I would say, they're not just related to my culture or can find, I guess, um, similarities among other cultures and um, ethnic heritages. They're quite universal. Um, we could, you know, discuss parenting differences because of where the, the person originated, where they come from. But at the same time, there are many parenting differences based on where people grew up in the United States as well. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's certainly like rooted in immigration, a lot of those issues, but they're not necessarily immigration related. They're very universal. 
And the more I talk to people about this, the more I just saw how everybody has different concerns, but at the same time, a lot of them are shared, no matter where they're from. That's Masha Rumer, and today we talked about her book, Parenting with an Accent, How Immigrants Honor Their Heritage, Navigate Setbacks, and Chart New Paths for Their Children. You can find a link to purchase that book and other books talked about on Fireside at our website, firesidepod.org. We're going to take a quick break and come right back to talk about best books. Hey, this is Blair Hodges, and I'm just taking a second here to stir around the embers, keep the flames going a little bit longer. And also, I wanted to say hi to everybody who stopped by at the Faith Matters Restore Gathering and said hi. I had a booth there and met some new people who hadn't heard of the show and met some people who had. If you're new to Fireside, welcome. Thanks for checking it out. All right, let's check out a review here, one of our more recent reviews. This came from Matt Kern. Uh, Matt says, thanks for saving me a seat. I love the lineup of season one, and so far season two is even better. Fireside features such a fascinating variety of authors and topics, and each episode ends up surprising me with how relevant it is for my own life and experience. Thanks, Matt. That's exactly what we're trying to do here together at Fireside. Um, I have a question. There's this old review. This is a review from last year from someone who goes by Mom and Dad Have iPhones. And the question I have is, the review says this is an excellent podcast. Um, It's interesting. Uh, Blair's contributed more books to my to-read list than anybody else, but they gave one star. And I think either they had given a five-star review and then changed their mind, or maybe mom and dad have iPhones, uh, don't know how to use their iPhones as well. (laughs) And they accidentally hit one star instead of five. If you or mom and dad have iPhones, if you reviewed the show, go check it out. Uh, Make sure that, that, that you hit five, unless you wanted to hit one, you know, hey. Uh, that that's on you that's up to you all right also i wanted to say if you're enjoying this episode if you're new to the show there's more Uh, season one has 10 episodes and then season two is ongoing so check out the other episodes there's more than just this episode to enjoy all right but we are enjoying this episode it's time to get back to the interview we're back with Masha Rumer. It's Fireside with Blair Hodges, and we talked about her book today, Parenting with an Accent, How Immigrants Honor Their Heritage, Navigate Setbacks, and Chart New Paths for Their Children. I highly recommend this book. And now that I've highly recommended this book, it is your turn, Masha, to highly recommend another book, a best book. It could be something that you read when you were a kid that changed your life. It could be something you read this month. A lot of different possibilities. I'm always excited to find out what people brought to recommend. So take it away. What have you got for us? Oh, my goodness. So many things come to mind, but I would probably have to recommend right now a book by a Ukrainian born uh, Jewish author who also is an immigrant um, who just released it a couple of years ago, but the new, but the paperback version was just released a few months ago, I believe, or maybe it was last year. It's uh, called Nesting Dolls and the author is Alina Adams. So she, she's a prolific writer. She also used to write for, write, um, for soap operas. So you know that the plot is going to be very good. It's a novel (laughs) and it traces the history of three different generations in one family, starting with Odessa, Ukraine. Um, and it ends in, um, in Brighton beach in, in New York. So it, I think it very interestingly, and especially now it's relevant, um, describes the history of persecution in the former Soviet Union and in Ukraine and how it's seen through these people's eyes and at the same time through family sagas. Um, it's it's incredibly captivating and it, if anybody is interested in learning more about oppression in the Soviet Union or, you know, the key historical events, I think they would really find it fascinating. It's a historical novel. It's It, it really just captures that also the immigrant experience in the last part and it captures the experience of, you know, being discriminated against, you know, in terms of anti-Semitism and certainly the issues related to gulags and, and so on. It, 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 it's fascinating and it, I just found it very healing and informative to read it. Um, and if I may recommend just one more, I know you have sure, just yeah. one, but... Oh, well, a few people sneak in extra ones. It's, it's not unprecedented. So. <laughs> it's also related to what's happening right now. And I, it's so important to elevate voices from Ukraine right now and um, uh, the men's literature and poetry that's happening there. So one other book I'd like to recommend is a book of poetry translations of Ukrainian poets that write in Ukrainian and Russian. And this is translated into English. It's called Words for War, New Poems from Ukraine. It actually came out in 2017. 
which kind of tells you a lot about how long people have been, you know, mm -hmm. the, the conflict has been going on in the war since 2014. So um, it deals with those issues. Yeah, Russia's been pushing into and taking over areas in Ukraine. Oh yeah, since 2014, if not if not mm -hmm. longer. So it's it, it's a really touching tribute to that and describes how people are experiencing it and how it's been for them. So those two books. Great. So Words for War, New Poems from Ukraine, and the other one was The Nesting Dolls by Alina Adams. Again, people can check out the book Parenting with an Accent, How Immigrants Honor Their Heritage, Navigate Setbacks, and Chart New Paths for Their Children. Masha, thank you so much for spending the time here at Fireside with us. Thank you so much, Blair. It was a pleasure. Fireside with Blair Hodges is sponsored by the Howard W. Hunter Foundation, supporters of the Mormon Studies Program at Claremont Graduate University in California. It's also supported by the Dialogue Foundation, a proud part of the Dialogue Podcast Network. All right, another episode's in the books. The fire has dimmed, but the discussion continues. Join me on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at PodFireside, and I'm on Facebook as well. You can leave a comment at firesidepod.org. You can also email me questions, comments, or suggestions directly. The address is Blair at firesidepod.org. And please don't forget to rate and review the show in Apple Podcasts if you haven't already. Fireside is recorded, produced, and edited by me, Blair Hodges, in Salt Lake City. Special thanks to my production assistants, Kate Davis and Camille Messick. And also thanks to Christy Franson, Matthew Bowman, and Kristen Ulrich Hodges. The opening theme song is called Great Light by Deep Sea Diver. You can check out that excellent band at thisisdeepseadiver.com. Fireside with Blair Hodges is the place to fan the flames of your curiosity about life, faith, culture, and more. See you next time. <laughs>